So our next lecturer will be Paul Dermeyer. Paul is a professor at the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic, Atmospheric, Oceanic and Earth Sciences at the George Mason University. Paul is also a senior research scientist at the Center for Ocean Land Atmosphere Studies. Paul um, works on studying the role of the land surface in the climate system. This includes the development and application of land surface models, studies uh, of impact of land surface variability on the predictability of climate interactions between terrestrial and atmospheric branches of the hydrologic cycle and impacts of the land use change on regional and global climate. Paul um, is also a fellow of the American Geophysical Union as well as the American Meteorological Society. And Paul was also a senior Leonardo lecturer at the EGU European Geophysical Union. Thank you again, Paul, for accepting our invite. Look forward to your lecture. Thank you very much, Anish and Judith, for inviting me and giving me this, this opportunity. And thanks to Andy for uh, the great presentation covering sort of the hydrology side of the problem, as well as the applications and operational hydrologic forecasting. I'm going to go more into, um, you might say, the, the theory and uh, processes that go into our ideas, our current understanding, conventional wisdom about the role of the land surface in subseasonal to seasonal prediction. And so um, there as a sort of uh, preamble, I would say that what we're really looking at or trying to, dis to discern is when and where is the land state important to the atmosphere, to weather and to climate. And it just so happens as I'll show that sort of the, the peak of this impact happens to be in subseasonal timescales. So the analogy is very much like with ENSO, right? We pay a lot of attention to the equatorial Pacific sea surface temperatures because we know that's a strong driver for aspects of weather and climate around the globe. And if you live in the US, you're particularly paying attention during the winter because that's the season when there's the strongest impact. So there's similar geographical and temporal variations in how the land can affect the atmosphere as well. And that's what we're tr really trying to get at. So um, for that, let's see, so we'll move along. A little bit of history to start off with. Um, back in the 19th century, during the uh, westward expansion of, of European settlers into North America, Manifest Destiny, there was a phrase that was bandied about a lot saying that rain follows the plow. People would look at the Great Plains, Western US and say, that's just a big desert. I mean. Um, people who grew up on the East Coast or who come from Europe, very different kind of climate. We can't farm there. And, you know, the real estate speculators would say, ah, don't worry about it. Uh, if you plant your crops, the rains will come. And of course, this was really just a marketing scam for real estate. In fact, the same argument was used in the early 20th century to settle the interior of Australia. And they sort of benefited from the fact that, um, you could that they had a wet period, uh, a very unusually wet periods during the settlement when people moved out. Oh yeah, look, it actually is raining as I'm planting crops. Of course, eventually comes a drought and then everyone starts to question, well, maybe they were lying to us. Maybe there really isn't this land surface feedback on the atmosphere, which mind you was not a scientific hypothesis. It was an economic <laughs> marketing hypothesis. So we might say, well, obviously the droughts proved that this was wrong, or did they? Trying to build up a little, little suspense here as we go forward, make it more interesting. Okay, in the, into the modern era, Jerome Nemias we consider the father of long range forecasting, especially in an operational sense. He was not a modeler, uh, but he was really not much of a statistician either, to some extent he was, but really just a very a clever and observant uh, person working at what was called the Weather Bureau back then, now the National Weather Service. And he showed observational evidence and even proposed mechanisms that the land surface could be a source of memory from season to season, that what happens in the previous season has a bearing on, on future weather, that there's predictability here in terms of forecasting. 
He found that persistence of springtime conditions into summer existed over parts of the United States, mostly in the central US, not much on the East Coast, not much on the West Coast, but the central part, he found that this was the case that heat and dryness were correlated. A hot, dry spring tended to be followed by a hot, dry summer, for instance. And that these temperatures of the surrounding oceans, which is kind of our conventional climate view um, of forcing, really conditioned the atmospheric circulation over the continents. So the little uh, contingency table here on the right is actually from one of his publications back in 1960, uh, before even I was born. Um, and it showed that cold summers tended to follow cold springs over sort of the Western Great Plains, the high plains between sort of the front range of the Rockies on into say Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma. And this area has the most continental climate in North America, in other words, least influenced by oceanic air masses. And what you see here outlined kind of the yellow bars show the temperature relationship, spring temperatures on the, the left column, and then um, the summer temperature on sort of across the top, that uh, two and a half times more likely that a cool summer would follow a cool spring than a hot summer following a cold spring, for instance. And then furthermore, warm summers tended to follow warm springs, but not quite as high a probability. But when you start to factor in precipitation, which is sort of the, the other parts of the column, it's another predictor. Hot summers followed hot, dry springs, and cool summers tend to follow cool, wet springs. In fact, it's five times more likely that a hot summer will follow a warm, dry spring than a cool summer would follow a hot, dry spring. You might say that's kind of intuitive, but you know these were the first numbers to really put behind it. That was observational. On the modeling side, evidence goes way back. Shukla and Mintz in 82 provided one of the first uh, atmospheric climate modeling studies to demonstrate the impact of land moisture anomalies on precipitation. It's kind of a, a hit it with a big stick experiment, uh, uh, tremendous extremes. In one case, two runs, one case, all the continents are prescri prescribed to be perpetually wet. They're just swamps everywhere. The other one, perpetually dry. You just pave the continents over, turn them into parking lots. And then you see how the boreal summer climate responds. And they found positive feedbacks almost everywhere over land. When the ground was wet, you would get more rainfall. They would keep the ground wet. When the ground was dry, you would get less rainfall. The one exception, curiously, was over India, which had negative feedbacks. And that had to do with the thermal driving of the elevated heat source over Asia, drawing in a stronger circulation, actually changing the flow and, and bringing a lot more moisture from the Indian Ocean up over the continent, kind of the classical monsoon driver. But when you have a numerical model, you can, you can answer all kinds of questions. You can do sensitivity experiments. How large is the impact of a particular land anomaly on the atmosphere? What are the relative roles of ocean versus land? and the chaotic nature of atmospheric dynamics in determining climate over continents and weather predictability and predictions. You know, models are great tools. You can make changes and you can see the results uh, in ways that you can't or, or maybe shouldn't do with the real world. We're kind of doing that right now with climate change. It's a, a real world experiment. But again, what we really want to know is how do these land atmosphere feedbacks work in nature? It's one thing to play with models. Are the models right? And it gets to, to David's question to Andy earlier about, do we have the data to validate and to understand these models? So the processes that link land and atmosphere, it's the surface fluxes, okay? The physical link is there. Um, through the energy balance, you have the radiative fluxes, short wave and long wave, downward and upward, what's cl classically called the four components of radiation, the thermal and the, the, the visible solar part. And the sum of those is the net radiation that's available, the net energy available at the land surface. They can then be partitioned into uh, sensible heat fluxes, basically warming of the air by contact against a hot surface or the arrow going the other way. If the ground is colder than the air, then the a sensible heat flux will be from atmosphere to land. Latent heat flux, which is the energy that it takes to evaporate water and that can latently be realized elsewhere when that water vapor somewhere else in the atmosphere condenses into cloud, that heat is then released. And then ground heat, which I list here as a residual. 
And all the little terms there show the, the variables, the state variables and the parameters that affect these uh, particular fluxes. And then the ground heat flux is the residual. It's kind of like the, the, the budget, the sum in your bank account of all the withdrawals and deposits ends up changing your balance in the end. And that change in balance is what goes into additional heat storage or taking heat out of the soil. Likewise, there's fluxes in the water cycle as well. There's a water balance, precipitation being the big input. Evapotranspiration is the same as the latent heat. They're the same, the same process, except in one we're quantifying it in terms of a mass of water flux, and the other we're talking about an energy. What's the energy it takes to evaporate that water? And then runoff, drainage, um, which is basically, you know, much of Andy's work, Andy Wood's work is in that realm. And then changes in storage. Soil moisture is a change in storage. So is the groundwater. So is snowpack. So is water in reservoirs and lakes. These are all parts of storage change. Even water stored in the bodies of the plants themselves, of the vegetation, is a variation in, in storage. So each of these arrows that we show, they're either sparsely measured, poorly measured, or basically unmeasured, unfortunately. Again, getting to, to David's question about observations to validate these things. And this has been a big issue. And it's why progress in this sort of land atmosphere interaction realm has been slow. Things are finally improving significantly over the last 10 years or so, both in terms of in situ measurements and being able to utilize satellites to do a lot of, uh, a lot of the observation on a large scale. But you know that's kind of in, pro in process right now. And again, these are all the things that are happening just right at the surface, at that interface between land and atmosphere. And there are process chains that link land, land state anomalies back to the atmospheric components like clouds and radiation. And I show this here, all these little abbreviations. Basically, we're going from the Earth's surface on the left on up to the free atmosphere on the right. Surface and subsurface soil moisture, net radiation, surface temperature, are all things that can then feed into these surface fluxes, the latent heat flux and the sensible heat flux. EF, you'll see a lot in my talk, evaporative fraction. That's basically the fraction of the net radiation that's going into evaporation, that's going into the latent heat flux. And those fluxes affect the near surface humidity, Q, and the temperature, T. And those then start to affect the lower atmosphere, boundary layer, uh, uh, processes and quantities, characteristics, like the depth of the boundary layer, how much entrainment at the top of a rapidly growing boundary layer, the lifted condensation level from your thermodynamics class, parcel theory, how far do you have to lift a parcel before it will cool to the dew point and form a cloud, and the moist static energy or moist enthalpy in, in the boundary layer. All of these things go towards determining if and how strongly you create clouds, you generate precipitation. Okay, now these are all arrows going in one direction. Of course, there are arrows that go the other way. Obviously, rainfall directly affects soil moisture. When it rains, you get mud, right? So we're kind of taking that as given and obvious. Here, the key is to look at the more subtle feedbacks from land back to atmosphere that they create this linkage. Um, now, these pathways involve the water cycle or the energy cycle or both. The blue lines are basically purely water cycle pathways, links in the chain. The red lines are purely energy cycle. And then there's sort of a, a, a rainbow pattern of degrees of water versus energy that we're showing in these different links. And also when we model this, they fall into the purview of different components of, a, of an earth system model. The first two columns are really the land state and the surface fluxes are really calculated by land surface models, like Andy mentioned earlier. And then the near surface temperature, humidity, and all the atmospheric components are part of a GCM, a general circulation model. And so these components are coupled and they have to talk to each other every time step and pass this information, these fluxes back and forth uh, to operate correctly. And then the arrows also make it seem like it's a sequential linkage, things kind of moving along. And in fact, when we have computer models to simulate this, climate models, they necessarily represent these processes in a sequence of subroutine calls. But in reality, everything's happening all at the same time, which makes it very challenging to untangle, especially in observations. 
in a model, you could go in and pick one of these arrows and sort of change the code to, to remove a link. And then you rerun the model and you see how things change and say, ah, this link is important and it causes this response. You can't really do that very easily or very wisely in the real world. So understanding these links and process chains in, in the real world, in nature and observations um, is, is tricky to suss out. But we do have statistical techniques and process-based te process techniques and metrics to do this. But that's a whole nother topic and a whole nother 45 minute lecture, which we're not gonna get into here. Now, if we sort of turn this the right way around on its side so that the land's at the bottom and the atmosphere is at the top. Oh, I was gonna also mention, sorry. Um, this is a very local coupled view, a one dimensional view through the atmosphere, neglecting circulation. This is just saying what's happening between the land surface and the atmosphere directly above it. And then we'll get into the, how the circulation comes into play in a moment. But if we turn it on its side and we look at this as kind of a, a, a pipe diagram of, of flows of, of water and energy, we can actually quantify this and using data from flux towers and from in situ measurements and soundings and so forth, we can quantify over time a kind of climatology and see how does that compare uh, observations versus models. Here, a particular location in Arizona we're looking at where we have flux measurements and meteorological measurements and rain, fault, rain gauges and so forth. We can see these linkages. And here the, the arrows, um, the colors indicate the correlation between the starting variable and its downstream variable. So if A is the forcing or A is the driver, the land surface driving the atmosphere, B is a response variable. The colors from blue to red tell you the correlation between A and B. The green boxes tell you the variance, the standard deviation of that particular variable. Over Arizona, specific humidity varies a lot and the moist enthalpy varies a lot. And there's a strong connection of humidity determining the moist enthalpy in the lower atmosphere. It turns out, say in the era five reanalysis, they underrepresent this uh, variability and the thickness of the arrow is the coupling strength. It shows a very weak coupling. Oh, We've got a problem in the, in the ECMWF model. It's not representing this process well. If we look in the UFS, the newly developed forecast model, it's under development for the weather service. We see it does that pretty well, but it's like way overdoing some of the land surface to atmosphere coupling in this desert regime. Um, so this is becoming a very handy diagnostic tool. So this is all thermodynamics now, not the dynamics. This is sort of just looking in the, in, in the column. Now, as soon as the sun comes up, we have land surface impacts on the atmosphere. Here we're looking at a location in Kansas uh, and showing the difference in the daytime daily evolution of various um, quantities in the atmosphere and at the land surface between having wet soil versus dry soil. So here's our evaporative fraction in the upper left. Higher values mean we have more latent heat, less sensible heat. When the soil is wet, we have a very high evaporative fraction throughout the day. When the soil is dry, it dips down to very low values around one, two o'clock in the afternoon, and then rebounds again towards sunset. Net radiation is pretty similar between the two, and the ground heat flux is a little stronger when we have dry soils and we have wet soils, but we see a big difference in the depth of the boundary layer. A daytime boundary layer grows much deeper when the air is dry than when it's wet, because when the air is wet, you don't have to lift it as far before it saturates and makes a cloud. Kind of makes sense, right, from dynamics. The lower right is what's called a mixing diagram. And this is actually an extremely useful tool and metric for understanding what's going on. The x-axis shows humidity. In this case, it's specific humidity in grams per kilogram. The y-axis is the potential temperature, two meter potential temperature um, in Kelvin. And each dot is an hour throughout the day from sunrise to sunset. So we see when the, when the soil is wet, we start off relatively cool and moist atmosphere and it just gets moister, warmer, but especially wetter and wetter throughout the day until sometime around four o'clock in the afternoon, we hit the peak specific humidity and then it kind of levels out, drops back a bit and our temperature stays at a certain level. In a dry soil case, on the days with dry soil, we start with a much lower atmospheric humidity, 
the atmosphere only gets wetter from evaporation until about 10 o'clock. And then the rest of the day, it just dries out and gets really hot. And we hit a much higher temperature, a much drier situation. You could take this Q at the bottom, multiply it by the late heat of vaporization and take this theta and multiply it by C sub P. And then you would have energy units. You would have joules per kilogram on each axis. And then you could actually uh, connect this to your sensible heat flux input, your latent heat flux input, entrainment of energy from the top of the atmosphere, and really understand the components of what's going on. And also when you do that, then the slope of one of these lines actually starts to correspond to the Bowen ratio. So it, it encapsulates a lot of information to tell you how the land and the atmosphere uh, are connected and interact. Okay, so to give it sort of the, the very descriptive um, empirical uh, right side of your brain <laughs> picture of land atmosphere feedback. So you can think of it as being like a recipe that needs to have three ingredients. There has to be the sensitivity by which I mean, when and where is there an active coupling from land to atmosphere? If soil moisture is changing, if the vegetation is evolving, if uh, there's snow or no snow and the atmosphere doesn't respond to it, doesn't change, then who cares? right? The land is not important. There are parts of the world where this occurs, like places where you have very strong onshore flow most of the time. The coast of Oregon, land surface state doesn't affect things because it's the Pacific Ocean that's really determining the climate there. Variability. So a coupling results in a significant impact only when the land surface anomalies are large enough. When they change, you can have a lot of sensitivity, but if the land surface doesn't change, it's never realized. The Sahara Desert is a great example. There's really strong sensitivity of evaporation to soil moisture. You add water to the soil, there's so much heat, there's so much sunlight, it evaporates readily. But there's just never any soil moisture because it never rains. So there's a lot of sensitivity, but no variability. Every day is as dry as the last. And the last one is memory. So if the coupling and the anomalies are not persistent, if they don't last very long, then the effect on the atmosphere will be short-lived and the impact will be minimal. For instance, when you have very sandy soil over, over a karst terrain, a lot of underlying uh, uh, chalk or, or limestone, and yes, geology matters in all of this too, you can have pouring down rain for three days and then the water will just drain out of the soil very quickly and it will go back to a dry state within a couple of days. There's not much memory in a situation like that. Okay, so sensitivity. This is kind of what it looks like. So here's a plot, soil wetness on the x-axis going from zero is completely dry to one is saturated. And then the y-axis is the evaporation rate. In this case, it's shown in, um, in watts per meter squared. And so there'll be some very low range of soil wetness where there's basically no evaporation. The water molecules are locked into the soil. They can't really get out. And then you hit the wilting point and then suddenly evaporation increases very rapidly as soil moisture increases. This red area is an area of very strong sensitivity, a range of soil wetness. Then when you get above a certain point, a wilting point, then the soil moisture is no longer increasing with, I mean, the evaporation is not increasing with increasing soil wetness. There's a lot of spread. So clearly there's other things that are affecting evaporation, but it ain't soil wetness. So this is where you would have a range of sensitivity. And again, in that high range, what's actually happening here is that things like wind speed and how dry or, or warm the air is, is affecting the evaporation rate. If there's clouds or no clouds, that's really what's controlling it. The atmosphere is controlling it in this range. Your energy limited in this range, as opposed to here where moisture limitations are controlling the evaporation rate. And so that slope is a measure of the sensitivity and how tightly those dots are grouped along that line, the correlation is also a very strong measure of this coupling strength, the sensitivity. Another way to portray it here, this is the mean evaporation rate. And then uh, the y-axis is the sensitivity of rainfall to a change in the local ET. And it shows there's sort of a medium evaporation rate, probably somewhere in the middle of this red line, this slope, where the rainfall is most responsive to changes in evaporation. So the, the green plot is that land surface component, land connecting to the surface fluxes. And then down here is that surface fluxes connecting to the atmosphere, links in the chain going all the way up. 
So variability is whether a location is moving around. If from day to day, you're moving back and forth within this range, then you have the variability to for the land surface to be driving changes in the weather. If you're up in this wet range, moving to higher and lower soil wetness in this rather wet range isn't resulting in anything at all. This is what the variability looks like. This is a map of the standard deviation of daily uh, soil moisture. The left column is the surface soil moisture, top 10 centimeters. Uh, subsurface is on the right. And this is going from April, May, June in the middle, July and August. So you see global patterns. Dark colors are a lot of day-to-day -day variability. What you see, this, this strong band that kind of migrates north from month to month is basically the snowmelt front. Uh, whether the snow melts earlier, later in a particular year, when is it melting, how much is it melting? Melting snow increases the soil moisture. So you see that in that region. The largest variability is there. Also in transition areas between arid and humid zones, like the Sahel of Africa, between the wet tropics and the dry deserts or the US Great Plains where it's humid in the Eastern US, dry in the Western US. These are places where you tend to have a lot of this variability. And here's a map of soil moisture memory, for instance, persistence of anomalies. Again, surface soil moisture on the left, deep soil moisture on the right. There's more, the deeper you go in the soil, the, the, the more memory you have, the longer the time scales. But again, we see these spatial patterns. Very long memories where it's arid, that's deserts, that's also non-desert areas that have a wet and dry season when you're in the dry season. A lot of the Southern Hemisphere subtropics is in the dry season during June, July, August. And so those areas will have a lot of memory. If you had a, a, if the wet season was really wet, that wet anomaly will carry through the entire dry season as it's drying down. Whereas if you had a, a failed monsoon, a, a dry anomaly, then that you'll have a dry soil moisture but they will stay separated. Those two years will always stay different from month to month to month, very long memory. Long memory where the ground is frozen. If the ground's frozen, the water can't move. So the soil moisture stays the same. When it's covered by snow, it's sort of isolated, insulated from the atmosphere. Short memories where it's humid, where it rains a lot. Short memory in forests. Forests are deep rooted. They can kind of moderate the soil moisture. And in fact, there's even a, a process called hydraulic redistribution by which plants will take soil moisture from meters deep in the soil and bring it up and redeposit it in the shallow soil. And it tends to moderate and prevent soil moisture anomalies from lasting very long. Okay, so quick recap of the theory. Pathways by which the land can affect the atmosphere, energy balance or energy cycle, water cycle. We sort of have these two legs, these two main links in the chain, the land states affecting surface fluxes, and then the surface fluxes propagating up into the atmosphere, a series of chains going up to clouds and precipitation. And then our three ingredients, sensitivity, variability, and memory. All the same mechanisms. Yes? Sorry to interrupt, Paul, three or four minutes. Oh, okay, I gotta get moving here. Um, so predictability and prediction, S2S, you've probably seen this diagram. Um, two to four week subseasonal range is a very hot topic. And it turns out that's right where the land tends to have most of its impacts. So you need those ingredients, you need good models, you need accurate analyses. And by the way, this diagram, you've seen it a few times already. It's meant to be representative of a mid-latitude location, sort of mid-continental, where an ocean anomaly takes a while from, to propagate from the tropics into, uh, into the mid-continental areas. Um, so, I mean, this is kind of reiterating, I'm going to skip that. Our positive feedbacks, they occur when a change in soil moisture, an increase in soil moisture results in an increase in evaporation, the plus areas, positive correlation. That means we're in an energy limited regime and soil moisture is driving evaporation. Uh, that happens when we're moisture limited. In an energy limited regime, it's the opposite. Evaporation goes up when there's more energy and that draws down soil moisture. They become anti-correlated. So the blue shaded areas, there's not a land surface feedback on the atmosphere. The red colored areas, there are. And so that's kind of a reversal. We've put a diode the wrong way in the circuit and now the current is not flowing. And snow cover tends to cut off the connection and we become uncorrelated, but we get zero correlations in that kind of a situation. 
Now, these, now we were talking about where are these couplings happening? It is mostly in these transitions between arid and humid regimes. And the Glacé experiment showed this with a dozen models simulating uh, climate in a way that we could quantify by playing with the soil moisture states, we could see the atmospheric response. And it turns out that these hot spots tend to be, this is for June, July, August, in these transitional regimes, the Great Plains of the US between humid and arid, the Sahel in Africa between humid and arid, Northwest India, Pakistan between the humid and the arid. It doesn't show up so well in this original experiment, but uh, many will quantify a band that kind of goes across the Eurasian steppes from Mongolia across to Ukraine is another band. If you look into de uh, December, January, February, you see areas in the Southern hemisphere that light up in Australia and South Africa and South America. So why is it there? I already showed that that soil moisture to surface flux region shows up in arid to semi-arid regions where you have a moisture limitation, but, but the atmosphere has to play along too. And it's in the humid areas of sort of the Eastern and especially the Southeast US is where you have high convective available potential energy and where the atmosphere is sort of primed to respond. An increase in moisture into the atmosphere will make it just that much more unstable and that much more moisture that can be condensed out into clouds and turned into convective rainfall. And where these two regions overlap happens to be right along the central US, kind of in that Great Plains area. And so it turns out in the prediction experiment, Glossa 2, which was a hindcast experiment, kind of like the S2S or sub X, but we did this about a dozen years ago. We find that if you look at the wettest half of all of the thousand, we did, I think, a thousand different forecast cases um, across many years, uh, ensemble members and forecasts. And the wettest half of the initial soil moisture anomalies had more contribution in the dry areas. And the driest half of the initial soil moisture anomalies impacted just on the wet side of that hot spot, which kind of makes sense. Because if you're in a dry location and the, the soil is anomalously wet, oh, you've moved into the sensitive range. Now we've got some predictability from the land surface. If you're in a humid region and the soils are kind of dry, now you've moved down into that sensitive range. And ah, now we have some predictability from soil moisture. And in fact, what we found was, and, and this is showing the temperature skill across 12 models. Uh, the top is with realistic land initialization at various lead times out to from uh, two weeks out to two months. The middle row is when we randomize the initial states of the land surface, but the atmosphere and the ocean states are the same. So we see very dark in the short range, that's initializing the atmosphere. That gives us a lot of predictability. Um, we have these patterns that show up in both that have to do with SST, this large scale forcing changes in circulation. If you take a difference map, what you see the red areas is where the land surface initialization is contributing some extra predictability, some extra skill into the forecasts. Interestingly, it's not really in the hot spot. It's in the Western US and kind of across the Northern tier. And that seems to have to do with the fact that the memory is actually weak in this Great Plains hotspot. The memory is stronger in the Western US. And early on in the forecast, it's the quality of the soil moisture initialization that gives you skill in your forecast. But as time goes on, it's areas that have a lot of memory that begin to dominate after three, four, five, six weeks. Because if you don't have memory, how are you gonna communicate skill uh, into a forecast six weeks out? And so this is a very interesting and useful tool as well to understand when and where is a land surface state important for forecasting. I'm gonna skip this slide about the contributions and focus on this land impact on prediction skill. So this was actually trying to quantify this with the CFS model, looking at April, May, and June initialized forecasts on the top for temperature, humidity, depth of the boundary layer and rainfall. So there's three curves here. There's a red curve, which is, well, let me start. Yeah, red curve is forecast where the land surface is not initialized realistically. The green curve is where it is realistically initialized uh, from reanalysis initial conditions. And blue is where we specify, we cheat. We specify the soil moisture states throughout the entire forecast. And in this case, these are all leads that are going out from zero days out to 
two months, 60 days. And so you see skill, of course, drops off with time. The difference in the curves are the shaded areas. The tan region is the difference between the red curve and the green curve, the effective land surface initialization. The cyan shaded area is the difference between the green and the blue curve. What happens when you include, when you specify perfect forecast, as it were, of the land surface days? And what you see is there's an immediate impact on day one, but the peak, depending on the variable you look at, is always between one and two weeks is when the land surface has the greatest impact. But that impact carries out for many weeks into the future, all the way out. The exception being precipitation. It does have a peak in about two weeks, but in this model, precipitation was very insensitive to land surface states, unrealistically so. This is something we're looking at correcting in UFS. So in fact, okay, so I'll go ahead and wrap up here. Uh, let me skip ahead then and whoops, to, um, to get just to the point of application. So, oh, here we go. Um, forecasting applications, a lot of talk about, uh, about droughts uh, by Andy to talk about the sort of the other side of the coin and, and heat waves. Um, oh yeah, right here. The 2020 heat wave in the Western US, we saw very warm anomalies, very dry dew point depressions. It was very much connected with very dry soil moistures. And you ask the question, did a hot dry atmosphere dry the soil? or did a dry soil heat the atmosphere? And the, the answer is there's a feedback, it's both. Uh, dry soils can greatly amplify a heat wave. You can have warm air advect into a region, desiccates the soil, that can feed back from day to day, creating a warmer and warmer boundary layer, storing energy in the atmosphere leads to a, an extended heat wave. And our current understanding is that this is what happens. And it was very prevalent in the 2018 European heat wave where we were able to show that in fact, the land surface states, the very dry soils, in fact, fed back on the atmosphere and created these very warm conditions. And in fact, there is a critical soil moisture that when you cross below that threshold value, suddenly you get hypersensitivity of temperatures to soil moisture drying conditions. Getting that breakpoint right and forecasting that correctly in a model is critical for getting heat wave forecasts, which you need to do on a one to two week time frame. So to quick summarize, predictability of weather and climate from land surface states comes when there's feedbacks. There's not always feedbacks. There's two legs in this path, um, land surface component and atmospheric component. You need to have variability. You need to have sensitivity. You need to have memory. And the effects start as soon as the sun comes up, but the peak is around one to three weeks and can last for several months. The impacts can be local, but there's also, I didn't get a chance to show the remote uh, effects, but um, there can also be downstream effects with teleconnections and Rosby waves, much like you have with SST feedbacks. So I'll stop there. Sorry, I went a little bit long. No, that was great, Paul. Thank you again. That was really great explanation of these complex feedbacks. So thanks. Mm -hmm.